So um, they asked me to, to speak on treatment options for spasmodic dysphonia, and I, I'm not going to take a long time to do that because you guys already know all the treatment options. Um, so what I'm really hoping is to maybe just give you an outline of some of the things that we do, maybe uh, let you think about some other things, and, and maybe if you, as Charlie indicated, uh, develop some questions for us, that would really be the most use. I think the most use for everybody here is to really hear your thoughts and, and some of your concerns and, and just how you've been approaching this, this problem yourself. So, um, you know, normally, I, I'm going to spend just a little bit on etiology, although I, I'm sure Christy will do a uh, much more complete uh, concern. But normally, you know, there's a remarkable matching between the pressure beneath our vocal folds, that's, that is to say the pressure that's produced from our lungs and the closing force of our vocal cords. And so right now I'm talking to you with about five centimeters of water pressure. That's actually not very much. Five centimeters is about that much, you know, that's the weight of five centimeters of water. That's what my lung is producing. And my vocal cords are closing just enough so that that pressure coming from my lungs is actually able to set it into vibration. And the vibration of the vocal cords is really not all that dissimilar from the vibration that occurs when you blow up a balloon and you let it go and it goes, you know, makes noise as it flies around the room. The vocal cords actually vibrate in a very similar manner to that, although it's obviously much more specialized uh, because we use it to, to characterize our voices so much. But in patients with spasmodic dysphonia, for some reason that's really not well understood, the vocal cords seem to close too tightly for the pulmonary expiratory pressure. And it doesn't matter how much pulmonary expiratory pressure patients apply to the, to the vocal cords, they just move up even higher. So not only do you have an increased amount of closing force, but there are also these spasms that all of you, uh, or that many of you express on top of that and it gives you that characteristic kind of strain strangled speech with breaks in it that we're all familiar with. Um, exactly why that happens, you know, it's certainly obviously central in origin, although you can postulate different, different theories that would explain it. You know, I have probably operated on maybe a th 300 patients with spasmodic dysphonia and I've actually had the opportunity to look at the nervous structures and the larynx of these patients and I can tell you that there's a lot of variability in the way the nerves look. Sometimes they look entirely normal. Sometimes they're kind of swollen and look kind of fatty. Sometimes they're very thin, uh, almost as though some of the patients have lost a lot of the axons that go, to the, that go to the muscles of the larynx as well. So there's quite a bit of variability, and it's conceivable that what we call spasmodic dysphonia is not really one disease at all, but indeed it might actually be s several different disorders that manifest itself as strained, strangled speech with voice breaks. I have a, a patient that, um, oh, so what are the different forms? There's probably more forms than this. I'm not sure I know all the forms of spasmodic dysphonia, but I tried to at least come up with, <coughs> with seven forms that I think is, is fairly uh, reasonable. There's the adductory form that, that most patients uh, exhibit. There's an abductory form as well, as we all know where patients have difficulty going from unvoiced to voiced consonants, so if they were going to say, help, they'd end up going, hope, as they had trouble closing their vocal folds. Um, there are patients that learn to compensate quite effectively for the adductor reform, and patients that can compensate for the abductor reform as well, and so sometimes when you see them, you, it takes a little while to ferret it out. Um, some patients, uh, I put down functional psychogenic. I don't really think there are any functional psychogenic forms of spasmodic dysphonia, actually. I think that there are some patients that come in that have functional dysphonias, and it's the, the job of the clinician or whomever sees the patient, the PhD, to try and figure out exactly whether this is really spasmodic dysphonia, which is clearly a neurologic condition, or something else going on. And then, of course, some patients can have tremor with the disorder. Some patients can have a mixed dystonia. They can express a certain amount of adductor, a certain amount of abductor. They can have tremor associated with it. And I think some patients might even have some muscular tension dysphonia associated with it, but that doesn't happen very often as well. So it's a very complicated disorder. 
uh, I don't think anybody really knows how many patients with spasmodic dysphonia exist in the United States. It's stated to be around 35,000, 40,000, something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually more than that. You know, it's a very rare disorder in Japan. I just saw a woman from Japan uh, two, three days ago that may have had spasmodic dysphonia, but it wasn't really clear in my, uh, the way she presented whether she did or not. Um, but it does, at least in the United States, cut a, cuts across all socioeconomic strata. Patients of different religions, patients of different cultures, uh, different, different walks of life, singers, professionals, actors. So um, there really isn't any one particular class of individual in the United States that's afflicted with this disorder, as far as I can tell. I talked to you a little bit about etiology. Um, so, Botox. Well, Botox is really the mainstay of therapy in spasmodic dysphonia. And uh, as you probably all know, Botox really doesn't work on the muscle itself. Uh, if you inject Botox into a muscle, uh, the muscle itself will still continue to contract. Botox works on the neuromuscular junction. It actually prevents the nerve from activating the muscle. But in and of itself, it really doesn't act on any muscles. Um, and the, the, in, we talk a lot about um, uh, patients with spasmodic dysphonia. It so happens that the nerve in spasmodic dysphonia that actually goes to the muscle is right underneath the thyroid cartilage. And so when I inject Botox into patients, what I'm hoping to do is to get to this neuromuscular area here, the area where the nerve ends on the muscle, because that's where the Botox actually prevents the nerve from activating the muscle and providing uh, relief. Um, you know, it's interesting. Well, many of the patients that I see um, that come to me for surgery have not had good responses to Botox for one reason or another. And it's surprising that there is a lot of uh, a difference in the neural anatomy between patients. And many of the patients with spasmodic dysphonia, and it even may be part of the reason that they develop it, actually show variation in the neuromuscular anatomy. And so sometimes I'll find the nerve, it'll be very low. It won't be where it's supposed to be in these patients. And that may very well be why uh, some patients don't respond as well as others. Uh, actually, this is a kind of a fun slide. This is actually a micro diagram of the nerve. As the nerve enters the larynx, it gives off a small branch to the muscle that opens the larynx called the PCA muscle, which is in the back of the larynx. And then it continues on and the nerve kind of comes out that goes all the way up to the top and it gives off a branch underneath the PCA muscle that goes to the muscle between the arytenoids called the interarytenoid muscle. And then as it, as it goes on a little bit farther, um, it, it'll actually end in what is uh, the anterior branch of the muscle that actually ends in that stellate configuration. Let me back up one. Oop, I don't know if I can. Maybe I can. I can go back up this way, though. Um, it'll, actually, it'll actually end here in this stellate configuration. And this gives branches to the false vocal cord and the true vocal cord and the medial portion of the true vocal cord. And so the anatomy of the larynx is actually very well understood at this point in time. You know, when I was in school back in the 80s, nobody understood the interlaryngeal anatomy, but now we realize exactly what it does, and it has allowed us to approach this, this disorder a little more intelligently than we were able to in the past. So what are the treatment options for uh, spasmodic dysphonia? Well, speech therapy, uh, RLN section certainly was popularized for a while, Botox injection, um, laryngeal framework surgery was uh, popularized as well, and uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about those quickly. So speech therapy, I don't want to spend a lot of time on speech therapy, except to say that I think a lot of patients with spasmodic dysphonia can benefit from speech therapy. As most of you know, speech therapy in and of itself isn't going to cure spasmodic dysphonia, but it has been shown to, I think, help patients work their disorder through their disease. And if you work diligently with a speech therapist, I think you can improve your speech with the dystonia. The problem is that a lot of our speech is extemporaneous. We don't really have time to think about how we want to say the word or what we're going to say. And, and so it, in those circumstances, it really isn't all that efficient. 
applications of Botox. So there's Dr. Ludlow's name right up there at the very top because she actually was one of the first people to recognize that botulinum toxin uh, was useful in this disorder. It had been used in, um, for uh, uh, other dystonias as well. Uh, myoclonus, helmifacial spasm, hyperfunctional vocal lines, um, all of these are muscle problems that Botox seems to assist in. So um, it, it's kind of a big word, but the Botox actually acts presynaptically. You know, the, the nerve comes down and it attaches to the muscle and it secretes a neuromuscular transmitter across this junction. And when the transmitter hits the muscle, then the muscle contracts. And what the Botox does, it actually attaches to the presynaptic area before the muscle and it prevents the muscle from releasing that neurotransmitter and it takes the body about uh, three months up to six months sometimes to actually resynthesize new uh, uh, new neuromuscular end plates so that the it can start and so during that time period you'll have release from the spasms. <coughs> so many years ago the Botox was, uh, the first Botox that came out was much weaker than the Botox that we have now and so the very first patients that received Botox used to receive about 15 units and that was prior to uh, the reconfiguration of it. Uh, but they did notice that it was, it was quite effective in this disorder. Um, back in 92, God that's 20 years ago now, uh, back in 92, that's a, that shows you that I'm a lot older than I thought I was, uh, um, um, was the first time we published a paper on the point touch technique, which is a technique that we developed uh, just because uh, a lot of patients weren't that happy about getting jabbed with uh, endoscopes and other things, and we wanted a kind of a, 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 a technique to inject Botox into patients that really just pretty much involved an understanding of the laryngeal anatomy and how to, how to identify that. And actually, uh, Joel Blumen and some other authors have just pun uh, published a paper demonstrating that the point touch technique as effective as uh, any other method of administrating Botox. Um, and it simply means that we either go transcartilaginous, which uh, we can oftentimes do in, in women, um, um, or we will find a way to go underneath the, the thyroid cartilage and at that point in time we usually have to put a little bend in the needle so it'll kind of bend up. So if your doctor wants to know how to go transcartilaginous with a point touch technique, tell them, I heard Dr. Burke say to bend the needle. <laughs> you can bend a needle? Yeah, you can bend a needle, they told me. So, um, for those of you with, with uh, abductory form of spasmodic dysphonia, um, that usually occurs in the PCA muscle. And you know, to inject Botox into the PCA muscle is a lot more difficult because it sits on the back side of the larynx, basically. And so we either have to go through the back part of the larynx, which requires that we go through a fairly thick cartilage called the cricoid cartilage to get to the muscle, or you have to turn the larynx 90 degrees and feel for where that muscle is and inject it. Both of those are not easy things to do for patients and require a little bit of uh, anesthesia to, for them to really uh, accept that. Um, nevertheless, um, I think that that's an effective way to treat patients. Part of the problem is, as you know, is we use the PCA muscle to open our vocal cords when we want to breathe. So when I take a deep breath like that, my, my anterior muscles are relaxing and the back muscles are constricting and they're pulling my glottis open so that I can get air into my lungs. So the same uh, muscle group that opens our larynx to breathe is the same group that's affected in patients with uh, abductory spasmodic dysphonia. And because of that, there's a fine line between treatments that you can give patients for that because obviously you need to have those muscles there to open the larynx and allow you to inspire. So how much do you inject? Well, th this is my uh, system of doing it and um, I'll show it to you now, it's not a big deal. The bottle has a hundred units in it, so the little bottles that we buy uh, typically have a hundred units. So this is, I'm talking about Botox A from Allergan. Um, and I uh, dilute that to f with four cc's of saline. So that means there's two and a half units in tenth of a cc. 
Have you ever seen how small a tenth of a cc is? It's pretty small. If you have a one cc syringe, a little tiny thin syringe, it's about the size of my little finger here, one tenth of that is two and a half units. And so in order to give patients an eighth of a unit or a sixteenth of a unit, which oftentimes we do, imagine how little, how little Botox we have to draw up in that dilution to do that. It's, it's really very small. And then I usually re-dilute that to about a tenth of a cc so that there's a little bolus of water, and that's what I usually inject into patients. Um, and the interesting thing about Botox is it has a very large range that patients require to get relief. So anywhere from, as I said, a sixteenth of a unit all the way to five units or more sometimes is needed in order to get a good uh, response in patients. I actually have one lady, it's interesting, she came in, she's actually a physician, she told me, you know, uh, I need like six, one six hundredth of a unit. And I looked at her and I went, nobody wants to get one six hundredth of a unit. And so for a few times I used to, I used to kind of like tell her, I'm going to fool this lady. I, I told her it's a six hundredth, but I'm actually going to give her one one hundredth of a unit. And so I would draw that up because I couldn't believe it. But no, nevertheless, she was very breathy for about a month afterward, and she came to see me, and I said, I'm so sorry, and now I believe you. And I actually, I actually draw up one six hundredth of a unit for her. She's exquisitely sensitive to, the, to Botox. So th there probably is no other medicine ever created that has such a wide dynamic range of efficacy that, except for uh, botulinum toxin. Um, what else did I want to tell you about that? Bilateral injections, unilateral injections. A lot of patients prefer unilateral injections. There's a little bit of a trade-off between how much Botox you give a patient, whether you give it unilaterally or bilaterally, and how long it lasts, and how much breathiness that they have to endure. So the larger the dose, the more breathiness. If you give it bilaterally, they'll have a little more breathiness as well, but it won't, uh, but it'll last longer. And every patient is different. You know, some patients come to see me once every nine months, six months, they want a large dose, they don't care. Other patients who really need their voices every day in their work or whatever, they just, they don't mind coming in every six weeks or so to get another shot. Um, and you just have to tailor the dose to whatever the patient needs. Uh, that's the job. Um, after, what happens after you inject patients a long time? Um, the thyroid cartilage, when you keep poking it with a needle, that's the cartilage where the needle go, will actually become a little bit calcified. And over maybe 20 years of injections, it'll become a little more difficult to actually place the injection. And so, is that a big deal? Not really. I mean, I, you know, I've had patients with 25 years that I've treated with Botox, and I can usually still find a sweet spot to put the needle. But as time goes by, it becomes a little more challenging. And that's why it's probably good to see somebody that does this a lot. Um, the development of antibodies. So Botox is actually used, as you know, for frown lines as well and wrinkles. Um, but there seems to be uh, a relationship between the dose of Botox given and the development of antibodies to Botox. And so I advise patients that are undergoing Botox injections not to get them for cosmetic reasons, just for that reason. I would much rather give somebody an eighth of a unit in their vocal cords than a hundred units in their vocal cords because they are, um, although now with the advent of Botox B and some of the other Botoxes, you can switch over, but it's not that easy to switch over and it costs a lot more money to do it than just use the Allergan form of it. Um, as I said, some guys use EMG or fiberscopes. Um, you know, if you're comfortable with it and the doctor is, is, uh, seems like he's competent, I think that's great. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the different kinds of, of Botoxes, and, except to say that for patients that no longer can use Botox A, um, uh, which actually has two forms now, an English form, Dysport, and a, and a, a form that's still from Allergan, there's a Botox B as well. It's probably, I, I put here that it's one half as strong, it's probably maybe less than that. It's maybe one quarter as strong. And so you really sometimes have to drop a large dose to get an effect for these patients as well. Um, and that may have something to do with uh, the, the toxic range of, of the Botox. Although, um, generally speaking, I guess I don't have it here, but I can say 
what is the uh, what is one unit? What is one unit in, in Botox? You know, we, we we measure Botox in units, and one unit of Botox is if you had let's say a thousand rats and you gave a thousand rats one unit of Botox into their into their abdomen, about half of them would die. So we call that the LD50, the lethal dose 50 for uh, one is, is the one dose, a mouse unit is really what it is. Mouse, I say rats, but they're mice. But guess what? You have about the equivalent of maybe two or 3,000 rats in your body that make you up. So it's a very small dose, and I wouldn't worry about it at all. But that's the way that we measure it out. And it kind of gives you some idea of the, uh, the strength of, uh, of a Botox unit. So who should perform injections? You know, sometimes patients will find that they, you know, it's not that easy to get to Los Angeles. You know, patients travel hours and hours to get there. I have one lady that actually has to fly in from Alaska sometimes to see me, uh, which is really a, a, a trek down here. Um, but um, I think any physician that's skilled in giving a Botox shot would only ask you two questions. Any other questions that the physician needs to know will probably indicate he's really not all that familiar with giving it. And the two questions are, how many units do you get? And when was your last dose? And, um, and anything beyond that, truthfully, like how do you do it? Uh, where does it go? How do you put it in there? Really indicates that the person isn't very experienced with giving Botox shots. But I get that. Believe me, I get it. Doctors will call me up and say, I'll tell them, yeah, I give, you know, I give uh, an eighth of a unit, and I usually do it unilateral. I go back and forth, and they'll say, well, how do you, where do you put it? How do you, where do you? and I say, never mind. <laughs> uh, is Botox an intermediate therapy or the final solution? People kind of get tired of getting Botox shots as the years go by. Some people, they're as happy as clams. But some patients just don't like it, especially males sometimes, find that the interval between the breathiness and uh, when their SD comes back uh, and they have a good voice is so short that they are not able to use Botox very efficiently. And that was really the reason that we went ahead and tried to develop some other alternatives for Botox, which heretofore probably really didn't exist. Um, these are reasons that some people give for, for uh, wanting to try some other routes, and I'm not even going to go into that. Um, so surgical analogs for Botox injection. Surgeries. So good old Dr. Ashiki, who's actually a plastic surgeon. He's not an otolaryngologist, lives in Japan. He's about, uh, I think Dr. Ashiki is about 75 years old. And you know, it's interesting in Japan, I hate to take this extra time, Charlie, but I have to say this. In Japan, you usually work at a university until you get old and then you leave the university and you go into private practice where you actually make money. So, so their system is quite different than it is in the United States. Although, I don't know, maybe no doctors are going to be making much money in the future anyway, so it'll probably be the same. Um, anyway, Dr. Ashiki, who's actually a very brilliant man, developed all these different types of uh, cartilaginous surgeries, you know, the voice box is a cartilaginous structure, and developed a whole series of cartilaginous sur surgeries to treat patients with, uh, with spasmodic dysphonia. Um, in addition to that, some patients have tried myomectomies, uh, which is actually cutting the muscle, because as you know, the muscle is part of what's in spasm. And then there are different types of uh, denervation and re surgeries. Uh, by the way, I don't really call it, you know, selective laryngeal adductor, denervation, re -innervation. We just call it DRE. Um, and this, the, in the nomenclature, they've called it SLAD-R, which um, is kind of, a, I guess, a sexy name, but I just call it DRE. Um, so I'm not going to spend time on the, that. Uh, laryngoplasties. The only thing I want to say about laryngoplasties is, and I'm going to summarize it very quickly, is they don't really work. Um, uh, it's not a, a cartilaginous skeletal problem in spasmodic dysphonia. It's a neurologic disorder, and you can change the cartilaginous skeleton as much as you want. It really doesn't help. Now, having said that, in some patients with abductor dystonia, if you move the vocal cords a little bit closer together with uh, a thyroplasty, they can actually get uh, some improvement. Why exactly that is, 
I don't think anybody knows. It probably has something to do with the feedback loop, uh, some type of the afferent system that's changed when the cords are a little bit closer together. But other than thyroplasty for uh, mild cases of abductor dystonia, uh, I don't think any types of the other laryngoplasties really are effective. Um, myomectomies. Um, Myomectomies have been tried, um, uh, both uh, endoscopic myomectomies through the mouth and external myomectomies uh, cutting from the outside. Um, typically, they don't really work all that well uh, unless there's a reason why you can't um, alter some of the other characteristics. Um, we, starting back uh, a while ago, based upon some experiments that we did with animals, and by the way, um, the, the SLAD R operation, the DRE operation, and I'll be happy to say it in public here right now, came about through experimentation on animals. And next time you see uh, an anti-vivisectionist group telling you that nothing is gained from medical experimentation using animals, these animals gave their lives so we could help people like you. Um, it, it pretty much just involves an advanced understanding of the neuroanatomy of the larynx. And what we found is that, um, based upon some of these early studies where they identified the interlaryngeal neuroanatomy, um, uh, and this is one of our very first animal experiments, that if we actually re-innervated the TA muscle with a different nerve than the usual nerve that's used, that the animal could not go into spasm, just no matter how much current we applied uh, to d try and make the animal sound spastic. It couldn't go into spasm, and that led us uh, into the notion that maybe we could do this for patients that really weren't being effectively treated with Botox. And here's kind of what the operation looks like. Just briefly, we make a little posterior window in the back part of the larynx, and uh, we cut the anterior branch of the nerve that I showed you before, and we graft on a branch of the ansa cervicalis, which is one of the nerves that goes to the eight strap muscles in the neck. So we have eight, 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 of eight ansa cervicali, and we take one of them and graft it on there. And that does two things. It prevents the muscle from atrophying over time, and hopefully prevents the uh, nerve from connecting back after we cut it. And um, over the years, we've kind of perfected the surgery and changed it a little bit. And I guess I'm happy to say that the results are pretty good in patients. They seem to be uh, uh, um, accepting the fact that um, it does help many of the patients stop using the injections. But having said that, if you're getting good results with your injection, I think you should continue with it. I have many patients that use Botox. I don't offer them the surgery. It's just an alternative that exists out there. Um, and you can see here's a picture of the nerve right there. That, that's the nerve that we actually find and cut. In God's infinite wisdom, he placed it right underneath the cartilage there for us to find. Um, I'm, I'm not going to show you the results here, but you know, pre-op and post-op, the patients certainly did better. I'm just going to kind of get to uh, the end of my talk because I've been talking for a while now. Um, we have, as I said, changed the surgical technique over time. Unilateral. So um, about uh, f four or five years ago, we did a series of patients with unilateral uh, DRE patients because these patients don't have the typical three months of uh, breathiness that a lot of the patients get while the nerves and we found that about 50 percent of them maybe it's more maybe even 60 percent of them actually uh, developed symptoms back uh, just because as time went by they still had um, um, a spasm on the other side and we've brought back a number of those patients and have done the other side and fortunately they've done pretty well but uh, in retrospect most of my patients come from pretty far away it's hard for them to make it to Los Angeles, so I don't do unilaterals on them very more for that reason. Uh, the candidate, adductor spasmodic dysphonia. Um, you know, you need to be able to uh, tolerate three hours of general anesthesia. And, uh, whoop, this is kind of changing by itself. Maybe I'm doing that. Um, and patients with tremor don't always get better because the, whoops, the, the larynx can still become tremulous afterwards. Uh, typical post-op course, as I said, breathiness for a while and then return of voice, usually within about three to six months. And um, 
I think that's really all I had to say. You know, hopefully during this time period, uh, many of you will write down some questions for me and we can all sit and talk about some of these things. I mean, you know, when I listen to you guys ask me questions, it really is beneficial to me too because you have a chance to think about this disease 24 hours a day, every day of the week. Uh, I think about it maybe eight hours a day, every day of the week, but you have it all the time. So thanks again for inviting me and let's go on with the symposium. <laughs>